Board of Trade influence in my town was way bigger. SIBO was still you know, kind of a new exchange just coming up. Spin off of the Board of Trade, as you know. So any influence from the neighborhood was Board of Trade. Uh, and you know, from there, I'm like, gosh, the trading floor is a trading floor. What's the difference? These guys are hiring. So I went down and took an interview right out of college for a uh, stock clerk at the SIBO. I'm like, this looks different than my buddies are describing. I'm like, well, they're across the street. So I'm like, oh, but this looks pretty cool. So if the first introduction was just, hey, it's a trading floor. Why not? How hard could that be? The first job was actually a stock clerk. So I walked into a pit in the hedge, obviously, for securities were the underlying uh, stocks. So I was the guy uh, filling stock orders for option market makers um, and did that for about a year before uh, Steve Fawcett had me clerk for him. Steve was one of those game changers in the industry. Um, and clerking for him, you started to learn, and needed to learn uh, derivatives and options, and it wasn't just about the hedge. Steve's tradition was to hire MBAs to trade. I did, was not one, and I was told quite specifically on my first interview, you're going to be a clerk. Steve only hires MBAs for traders. I'm like, sounds great. Don't have any idea what that means, I'll take the job. But as I worked more and more with Steve and clerked with him through a takeover deal, um, I really loved it and asked for an opportunity of a, a, a guy that worked for Steve, Bob Kirkland, who started a number of Steve's traders. And he said, I'm going to give you a shot. I got to pick one of three pits that Steve didn't have traders in already uh, and went out. No, not a whole lot of training other than observation and asking and trying to learn on your own. Steve believed in the randomness of individuals' thoughts and the st statistical distribution of the randomness of each individual instead of a much more regimented approach. Here, learn this book and do it this way. He thought more natural hedge would be to have 50 or 100 people thinking on their own. I had no dough, uh, so Steve put up the money for me to trade leased a seat. He actually owned the seats and leased them to us. And so the economics, uh, so you started, you, you'd be able to keep 45% of what you make. And then uh, that was a three-year deal. And each time you re-upped with him, the deal got better and better. Uh, some guys would do a three-year stint with Steve and they'd go out on their own. And Steve couldn't be happier. He started a thousand traders and they're still across the street. Certainly back then, I think the success rate was probably about 40, 45% of who he started, succeeded, uh, made it the first year, and then uh, it would break from there. Each and every year got a little bit better. And then the degree at which you were successful varied greatly. You'd have a PhD in physics who couldn't make a decision, smartest guy in the room, couldn't make a decision to buy or sell. Uh, and then you had um, really good, um, just pure stats. They can see numbers and statistical outcomes in their head. And you're like, oh my goodness, that person, how did they figure that out? So it was not perfectly predictable. I don't, not, not perfect. It wasn't predictable at all. My style of trading never uh, set up to be a home run hitter. Uh, so I was a short premium seller. Back then, I didn't know I was arbing the difference between implied and realized volatility. You learn that as you go. But I, so I tried to make money, a little bit of money every day. Uh, as opposed to the back spiders who were looking for a major move and made money 20, 30 times a year. So mine were little victories, a lot of singles, a couple walks, and then a couple whiffs. I never missed uh, events with my children and there was no travel. So that was pretty cool, really, really cool. The guy who did most of the work with me was Bob Kirkland, who was Steve's right hand, and his encouragement uh, was was more, way more of a mentor. And then my 
other mentor would have been after I left trading would have been Bill Brodsky, who just uh, I you know, wouldn't be here interviewing with you uh, if not for Bill. In '89, uh, I was on the floor with that major correction. That was the first time. I felt the economics of a huge move in the market. Um, 87 was just super interesting. I was on the floor, it started in August of 87, so by October I didn't know enough to know that this is really sideways. But by 89, the correction, you're like, oh boy, here we go. This is gonna have a tail on it, and it's gonna take a while to recover. Um, so that was, that was a lasting one. And then the first time you're on the wrong side of a takeover, you remember those, uh, and those leave a mark. And I uh, remember the, the first time I had a really, really bad day, went up to Steve's office and said, uh, I think I've completely messed this up and I've lost the money you've backed me with. He said, well, you weren't wrong. He said, statistically, you weren't wrong. But man, you lost all the dough. And I said, I know, I, I'm never going to do that again. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. You do exactly what you did again. You do it smaller and you, you hedge differently. But statistically, you should have been right. So that was a huge lesson from a guy who'd seen it all, been there, didn't give up on you, um, and coached you through and said, no, 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 you, statistically you were right, so you stick with that. And that was hugely lasting. And I'd made mistakes after that, tons of them, but always in the back of your mind like, okay, I, I still didn't do it wrong, I'm just, I'm wrong. And you gotta get over that. The first thing I tried to do was convince all the golfers that this was a great day for you to go golfing, you're not missing a thing. This is, this is a perfect opportunity, it's a great day. As a matter of fact, why don't you guys, why don't we all bet on who's gonna win? And anything to get somebody out of the pit. And then the others, you're like, lunch, why don't you guys, super lunch, Italian village, go see Vinny, just sit down, relax. If something gets crazy, just call in, you can watch the market, everything's gonna be great. So you wanted to get as many people out of the pit as possible when it was slow because the pie is only so big. And if it's slow, you know, one, of, one, of, one or two guys there, not a bad spot. Technology, uh, more uh, than just the pure modeling, but SIBO had gone to hybrid. Uh, so we introduced technology into the mix uh, and that really changed the dynamic uh, and just the speed uh, and the edge that we tried to capture uh, was you know, halved you know, every six months or so. Thank you.